here for those of you who are not in the area. Um, I'm Kevin Sauer, a professor in the Department of Food, Nutrition, Dietetics, and Health. And again, just wishing you all a, a very warm welcome for this very exciting lecture. And with that said, it's my pleasure to turn things over and introduce you to Dr. Tonda Kidd, Department Head of the Department of Food, Nutrition, Dietetics, and Health. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sauer. Um, good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the 46th Annual Shugart Lecture Presentation. Um, the Shugart Lecture Series, it brings dietitians and food service and hospitality experts to Kansas State University to enrich student um, curricula and provide continuing education for practitioners in the field. Established in 1975, the lecture series honors the late Grace M. Shugart, former department head in the College of Health and Human Sciences and co-author of Food for 50 and Food Service in Institutions. Shugart helped build the profession of dietetics and institutional management throughout the United States, serving as president of the American Dietetic Association she was also a Medallion Award winner and received the Marjorie Holzheiser Colfer Award, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics highest honor. So we have invited the Shugart family to join us virtually. And we just so thank you for their uh, continued participation and support in this series. And that's her grandson, Jeff Shugart, who's from Kansas and her grandson, Gary Shugart from Colorado Springs, Colorado, and daughter-in-law, Mary Ellen Shugart from Pensacola, Florida. So if you will all please look at the bottom of your screen in your reaction button and just join me in thanking the Shugart family for their continued support. So if you can just give them a hand clap, that would be outstanding or you can even do that too. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now before I introduce our speaker, I would like to um, ask anyone to also join me in thanking Dr. Kevin Sauer for his work and dedication to planning this event. And I know it could be something planning a virtual event is a piece of cake, but I'm sure Kevin may have a different perspective since I imagine there are lots of little things that's going on in the background that must be addressed that most of us would never appreciate um, or even know. So I do appreciate his efforts and his leadership he has provided working on this and with others and putting this together. So again, if you just hit that reaction button and go ahead and give Dr. Sowers a hand clap a thumbs up or something to show your appreciation for him putting this together. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so now let me introduce our speaker. David Donnan is a business leader and consultant to the consumer product, product. retail and technology industries and a frequent speaker to corporations and groups on topics related to international trade, food, and agriculture. During his career, David has run operate, operating companies, managed food plants, and consulted with leading global retail and consumer product companies in technology and supply chain strategies and market positioning. David is an adjunct associate professor at Northwestern University teaching a, grad, a graduate course on the future of sustainable food and agriculture. He is also a partner emeritus with A.T. Kearney, a global management consulting firm where he ran the global food and beverage practice. David is on the board of Naturally Chicago, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, Rubicon organics and a mentor to food entrepreneurs and startups at the Good Food Accelerator. So now I am going to turn the platform over to David. Thank you. Thank you, Tanda. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm so excited and honored to be speak to you at the Grace M. Shugart Lecture. 
I, I wish I could be there in person. I wish we all could be there in person, but uh, maybe next year at the, uh, at the Shugard lecture. Um, thank you so much. Let me just uh, put up my screen. I've got some, some presentation material I can share with you as well. And uh, hopefully the technology works the way it should work and we can uh, try it there. Okay, is it showing up all right? Looks great. Okay, perfect, good. So uh, today, this evening, uh, I wanted to talk to you about some of the new influences on our lifestyle and eating habits and how lifestyle eating habits are evolving with technology. And I spend a lot of time with consumer groups, with retailers. Um, I, I'm not a registered dietetic professional. I'm an engineer by background. But my career, 40 years, has been in the food industry from various aspects. And so I want to look at this interaction between technology, nutrition, food, consumer behavior, and how things are evolving. Um, first of all, just a question for you in the audience. You can put up your hand if you wish. How many of you wear Fitbits or smartwatches or iWatches or, or another type of device like that? Probably a lot of you do. Now I'm going to ask you the next question. How many of you have walked and looked at your Fitbit or smartwatch and noticed that you've taken 9,500 steps and you're at your front door and you turn around and walk another 500 steps in order to get that 10,000 target. I've done it, I know I have. That's an example of a nudge, a small change in behavior through feedback and positive reinforcement. They occur all the time and technology companies know it. And so they design their, their products to give you those nudges, to give you those little interactions. So let's just talk a little bit about food and culture. First, let's start with a little geography lesson. Our food and culture are intertwined and most, mostly based on geography and nationality. If you're a Japanese, you ate Japanese food. If you're a French, you eat French food. If you're Italian, you eat Italian food. And so our food and personal identity were very much tied together. But now with travel, immigration, and our food exploration culture, all types of food are available. And we identify less with national diets and more with other things we eat. In fact, now our food defines our culture. And in fact, if you talk to people, they will often identify them, introduce themselves as being a a paleo or gluten-free or a vegan or a vegetarian or keto or a pescatarian. People identify themselves with their diets now in a way they haven't before. And so people are actually forming food tribes around the type of foods and the diets that they have. And even people are, are what the ones that I like were either a reducitarian, which means I want to reduce foods, or a flexitarian, which generally means I'm a vegetarian during the week and a carnivore on the weekend at barbecue season. So this identification in food tribes around our diet has really defined our culture. And in fact, if you look at how food and culture come together, we really look at how our diets and eating patterns are being influenced by four major areas. One is rising healthcare costs. The second is around community, family, and friends. The third is our focus on well-being and the definition of well-being and wellness. And then the fourth is the one that I'm really gonna dig into is mobile technology and artificial intelligence or AI. So let's start with healthcare costs because whether we know it or not, they are influencing what we eat. So here's a chart taking from an international study which shows the annual average growth rate of gross domestic product, basically the economic measure and health spending. The red represents health spending. The blue represents gross domestic product. And on the bottom are all the different countries from Austria and Australia, all the way to the far uh, right hand side with the United States. In every case, healthcare costs are rising faster than our economy. <clears throat> In every case, we spend more on healthcare and the costs are rising rapidly. And Healthcare costs now become a major influence on personal household income as we're spending more and more on it. And if you look at the healthcare costs, China, which has been growing tremendously, had 11.7% growth um, in healthcare costs versus 10% in GDP. And in the US as well, we're having 3% healthcare costs where our 
our, our GDP has been going at one and a half percent to two percent. So this is not sustainable in the long term. And, and part of the reason why this is occurring is that for so long, for decades, our health system has been what space called a patient-oriented healthcare system. For decades, our healthcare systems were defined by doctor-centered approaches, passive, siloed, information-driven, paper-driven, and much of the paper-draped system were tied to your primary care doctor. Your primary care doctor was the one that gave you the specialist, was the one that referenced you, and you had to go through that kind of a, a, a very narrow system in order to get things done. But now, we're actually moving to more of a consumer-oriented healthcare system through mobile technology, portable health records. Our patient care is, is patient-centric, informed, open, digital, where an increased rise in value-based reimbursement is turning the traditional healthcare models on their head by driving improvements in delivery of care. And public's awareness of the impact of lifestyle behavior compounded with technology allows individuals to track their behavior and other metrics. In fact, healthcare is now a consumer product, just like food is a consumer product or clothing is a consumer product. And like other consumer products and like banking and media streaming and grocery shopping, we are gonna treat it differently than we have in the past. In fact, now healthcare is being influenced by a lot of different things. In fact, consumers are being influenced by this whole influencer relationship. Here are some four different influencers on nutrition, but basically Instagrammers. And as you can see, many of these influencers, bloggers, YouTubers, et cetera, are relating to their audience by talking to them in a consumer-oriented approach. Some examples are Kelly Levesque, uh, who has 400,000 Instagram followers, Rachel Paul, 400,000, even to the somewhat infamous Vani Hari, also known as the food babe, who puts out a lot of interesting, controversial, not always scientifically based uh, opinions on food and what's healthy and what's not. That's what's influencing us today. And so how does this change our nature in relationship with food? So here's a question. Who do you go food to first if you're looking for information on nutrition and on better eating habits? Well, I would think each one of you would say, of course, a dietitian, a nutritionist. That's who I'd go through first. But when you talk to consumers, although the dietitian and nutrition may be on the list, it's not necessarily the first person on the list. The first person on the list where people tend to go for nutritional advice, for diet advice, for food advice, is their mom and their family. That's who gives them most of their advice. I wanna to go to my mom, what have you cooked? What have you eaten? And that becomes an important one. The second area where people go for nutritional advice and diet advice is their family doctor. And unfortunately, my son's a doctor and in four years of medical school, he had uh, one week of nutrition training. So, I mean, nutritional training for doctors is there, but it's not extensive, it's not as deep, but people trust their doctors and go to them for advice. Who else do they go for? Well, as we get more wellness and fitness, they're going to their fitness instructors getting nutritional advice, and they're often going to the internet to get nutritional advice. And so these influencers are changing relationships as consumers become more do-it-yourself health advisors, trying to take their own nutrition and health and wellness into their own control. In fact, if we look at this whole idea of how do consumers pursue purchase decisions, Here's a, a recent survey that looked at what had the greatest impact on society. And the top bar is purchase decisions and the one below it in green is voting decisions. And what we found, particularly with millennials, is that more millennials believe their purchase decisions will have a bigger impact on society than their voting decisions. And you can see that manifest itself in the recent elections and particularly recently, as we've seen large consumer product companies like Coca-Cola, come and talk about political issues like Georgia and voting rights, et cetera. They realize that consumers will make influence by paying through their wallet. And the whole issue of cancel culture is embedded in this whole um, impact that consumers see that they now control the dialogue, they control the narrative because their purchasing decisions make a decision 
make a difference in what gets brought to the surface, what gets mass marketed, what gets brought by consumers. In fact, 70% of millennials believe they're influenced by their peers and 60% of consumers are influenced by social media when shopping. This is a much bigger influence than, than any other aspect. And I'm sure many of you as well, 50% of consumers post pictures of their food. And you can't go to a restaurant. It used to be the joke was that uh, restaurant chefs prepared foods that tasted good. Now they have to prepare foods that are uh, Instagrammable. So they have to look good on the plate in order that they can get posted as well. So consumers and interaction with food has changed with social media, has changed with our do-it-yourself uh, version of wellness and health. And, and all of these things are having an impact. In fact, if you look at how food sales are going as well, products that promote wellness are just demonstrating significantly stronger growth compared to Main Street items. So if you look at the last several years, overall food categories have grown around 2%, but natural and organic grow 6%. Refrigerated, ready to drink teas and coffees, 26%. Wellness bars and gels, 22%. Shelf-stable functional beverages, 16%. So we're seeing this heightened awareness of health and wellness categories experiencing double-digit growth. And in fact, what you saw during the pandemic was there was a, a pulling back at the initial part of the pandemic as we all hunkered down, as we all got into the lockdown, and we actually went to what, what we often call comfort food. We ate more pizza, we ate more pasta as we were trying to reduce stress, or as we were trying to get more comfort from our food. But we're seeing in the last several months, and particularly now, as we're starting to see the economy open up, consumers experimenting more, discovering more, looking for more taste, trying new things, but they're also looking at their health and wellness in a way that's much more important to them. In fact, people say COVID-19 is those 19 extra pounds you gained being at home for the last year, eating your home cooking and all that pasta. And so what we, we have learned in the lockdown and how people rebound to the lockdown is going to be an important factor on health and wellness as well. 49% of consumers follow some sort of prescribed or specific diet. And I'm sure many of you know of this already. You know, health, health heart healthy, high fiber, gluten-free, keto, South Beef, Weight Rogers, there's a myriad of diets out there. And as I showed you right from the beginning on culture, we have food tribes around some of these diets where people identify with the diets themselves. And so the pandemic saw an addition as nutrition became more important. And the reason nutrition became important because of stress release and also immunity protection. And so we want to improve our immunity. But this all comes together as, as not only just food, but also our activity levels and, and, and how we do exercise and, and what we see to, to look at improving sleep and improving stress, improving nutrition are all part of what's called a wellness economy. And in fact, the wellness economy is over $3.7 trillion worldwide. And you can see some of the aspects of it here. You know, eating and nutrition is $648 billion in, in size. But consumers see nutrition as part of a broader lifestyle approach to fitness, stress relief. Look at this uh, on uh, spa and mineral baths, 150 billion. Workplace wellness, 43 billion. Uh, wellness tourism, about going on tours that are either Epicurean tours or fitness tours or hiking tours, 563 billion. And then beauty and anti-aging, the cosmetic side of, of uh, wellness, is uh, almost a trillion dollars in itself. In fact, we're starting to see food categories that combine cosmetics and food together for a wellness factor. Uh, aloe vera now being in, infused into yogurt so that yogurt will help your skin tone, et cetera. So we're seeing all of these things be part of this wellness category that food and nutrition is part of, and you as dietetic professionals are part of as well. And so it is very much big business. In fact, Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, said that healthcare is very important for people. We are democratizing it. We're taking what has been with the institution and empowering the individual to manage their health. We're just at the front end of this. Apple, 
Google, Amazon are all heavily investing in healthcare and as a result, nutrition as well. And this whole democratization of health and nutrition is all part of our change on influence and how we identify with food that is healthy and it's going to help us with our lifestyle. So if we look at all this, we have to look at that impact of technology, as I said from the beginning. This chart should be one of the most scary charts you see. If you look at it, the bar chart, in 2018, we individually, each one of us, spent close to 6.3 hours per day on a screen, whether it's a PC, a tablet, or a phone. We spent six hours of our day looking at a screen. And I think that increased in 2020 because most of us were locked in Zoom calls like we are now. And we spend so much time in front of technology, in front of screens, getting our information from screens, getting our information from the internet. Our phone has become our communication device, our navigator, our alarm clock, our window to the world. And this has changed again, how we interact with uh, technology and how it interacts with us. In fact, sensor technology is becoming ubiquitous. It's everywhere. We're finding now that, again, we use our phone as our navigator with Google Maps, or we may have our home temperature system like the Nest system, which is an AI reinforced thermometer, or we may use fitness tracking as we talked from the beginning, or we may use precision cooking like the Juul um, uh, uh, vacuum systems for doing sous vide types of technology. In fact, worldwide wearable markets, the things we wear that, that track our activity and our health has grown 27% per year since 2019. It's a tremendously huge market of, of nearly $100 billion already, $100 million, and it's growing much quicker and faster as more and more products are coming to market. If we, if we look at some of these things and how we track our data, we're using these technologies, these wearables, to track our body weight, to track exercise and diet. We're looking at tracking sleeping. I mean, it used to be that at Christmas time, we thought that Santa Claus was the only one to know if we were sleeping or if we were awake. Now Google and Apple and, and other companies know it as well because they're tracking it on our watches and Fitbits that many of us wear to bed or our phones, which actually have sleep activators in them. And so measuring activity, measuring these different things are, are having a profound impact as technology becomes cheaper, smaller, better quality sensors in our systems as well. And so we're finding more sensors in more places every year. So what does this all mean? It will have profound effects. First, the technology provides us that instant feedback, that little nudge we talked about at the beginning. It gives us a little bit of positive reinforcement that makes us do more of that activity. Our food choices are being influenced by perceived outcomes. If I know that I walk more or I eat certain foods, I will lose weight or I'll, get, or I'll reduce my stress or reduce my blood sugar, I'm going to do it. And particularly if I get feedback on it on an immediate basis, I'm going to take advantage of that. And all of it will change how we choose our food. We are going to start to choose our food made based on machine recommendations, based on recommendations that are coming from artificial intelligence systems. And so these are all the things that are going to have much more a dramatic effect as we go forward. In fact, wearables are becoming so pervasive. We have COVID wearables now as well. Several companies have brought them out in the last year to measure your body temperature, like the, the, uh, COVID, the Aura Ring, or to uh, measure uh, your, your uh, blood oxygen levels as well. So that people are actually measuring these and many types of COVID apps are out there to actually measure if you're in proximity to somebody who, who has uh, had COVID or tested positive for COVID. In Canada, they've been using this uh, technology in order to keep uh, COVID cases under control and under track. So all of these things are, are having a big impact. And in fact, the sensor technology and these new technologies, more and more are coming to the, to the forefront. I work with a lot of startups in the ag tech and food tech space, and it's just remarkable the new types of devices they're coming up with. In fact, some of the next frontiers you're going to see are things like heart rate monitoring. On the Apple Watch version four that came out last year, 
it actually has can measure your heart rate and and has an electromonitor to measure when you're going into any type of irregular heart rate and will advise you and if you wish advise your doctor that you have a regular heart rate as well um, the, we always have a, a continuous glucose monitoring with the Dexcom so that it will actually measure either with a patch or some sort of device, measure your glucose. So you could actually eat a meal and then an hour later, measure your glucose level and see whether those carbs you know, increased your blood sugar or your other foods decreased your blood sugar. And all of a sudden you can start to monitor and measure and have the feedback necessary. And then new ones are coming along. Here's a, a prototype looking at a small sensor that could be put into your teeth or on the back of your tooth that would actually measure uh, different types of chemicals, uh, polymers that detect chemicals in the environment or have it actually measure alcohol level. So that if you had too much to drink, it would automatically inform you on your watch that, hey, you shouldn't be driving, take an Uber. <laughs> and if you think that's fantastic or you think it's a bit too far out there, we right now today are being influenced by artificial intelligence in our food choices. Any of you that use Open Table or Uber Eats or DoorDash, all of the recommendations that you get when you come up with your screen are based on much the same technology that's used by Netflix to actually help, made, help you pick out the next movie. It looks at what you've liked, it looks at what things you've not liked, it looks at what things you've scanned and which things you've sped by, and it comes up with recommendations based on artificial intelligence to recommend what food choices probably would be best for you. And similarly with the Uber Eats and DoorDash uh, types of algorithms, they're using the same thing for you to pick the best spot. Even more scary of all this is 40% of couples now meet online through various dating apps. Guess what the dating apps are based on? Machine learning and artificial intelligence. In fact, one of the jokes goes that machines, you know, we talked about the Terminator and about the, the machines taking over the world. Well, they're already indicating how we're gonna procreate because they're helping us decide who the right match is of couples and determining who's going to be, you know, getting married further on. So artificial intelligence has incredible influences on it. So if that wasn't scary enough, where are we going in the next 10 years? Let's just talk a little bit about some of these things. So first of all, sensors and wearables will be everywhere. They're becoming cheaper and cheaper. We're gonna see them being put on every type of device. You know, we'll see them on badges, we'll see them on clothing, we'll see them in shoes, all over. Second, more personalization and targeted meals will exist. If I know more about my blood sugar, if I know about my DNA, if I know about my food choices, I will want personalized and targeted meals. And consumer product companies, guess what? They're ready to jump on that as well to offer you very personalized suggestions around your meal choices. Second, third, transparency expected. I read labels. I not only not want to know what the product is, I also want to know is where did it come from? How was it made? And so transparency becomes very important. And so we're seeing large food companies deal with this whole issue of supply chain visibility, supply chain transparency. And particularly when consumers are asking questions about the environment, climate change, regenerative agriculture, many companies are focusing on trying to make those much more available to consumers as consumers are asking for this type of information. And then finally, shifting policy. We're seeing governments around the world moving beyond just strict dietary guidelines and taking in a broader view of health and wellness, whether it's activity or it even may be environmental concerns about where does your food come from and how is it made become important aspects of our overall um, nutritional dietary guidelines. So if we look at sensors and wearables, let's face it, the next generation of children are growing up with sensors and wearables. I have three grandchildren, four grandchildren, and it used to be, I was a boomer and growing up, my kids, we used to be called the helicopter parents because we would always hover over our, our kids. Now, my kids, I call them drone parents because they have devices everywhere. They've got a camera in the nursery and they've got a camera in the play area. And when the children go to the daycare, they have cameras looking at them as well. We're, these kids are the more uh, 
have more sensors and observing devices than, than any other generation. 300 million is in funding for baby and children monitoring startups alone. And 30% of consumers or parents are concerned with their friends judging what their kids eat. So you're gonna see this pattern of recognition as well. 64% of patients use mobile devices to monitor health. So this whole sensor and wearable devices, it's just gonna become more and more pervasive. On the area of personalization, we're seeing a new area of personalized food. Food companies are looking for increased level of personalization menu development. In this example, Habit Nutrition Test Kit is a comprehensive nutritional test that looks at your DNA and your blood to determine how your body handles carbs, fat, and protein, and then offers you menu suggestions accordingly. As I mentioned, we're seeing with the artificial intelligence and machine learning, more and more personalized menus. And many of the food companies I work with are trying to find out how to develop food that meets specific niches. It may be around an allergen uh, group of people. It may be around a gluten-free group of people. It may be around people that are pre-diabetic, but they're creating menus and food items that are specifically going after populations that have similar behavioral aspects. The future of food is gonna be even more interesting. One of the sites that I always like to go to is the Alpha Food Group, and they come up with what they think is gonna be the future of food. Here's some examples, CRISPR chips. And CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspersed Short Palindropic Retreats. And what this is is gene editing, the ability to edit genes. And so their example is maybe we'll have potato chips that are based on genes edited to reduce the amount of carbs or, or increase the nutritional value. Analyze me, the gut biome. I may be able to take a pill that will actually have a sensor that will sit in my gut biome and analyze my ability, my, my ability to, uh, to, to take my food and, and digest it and how much of it I get absorbed, et cetera, and report back to me on that so I know which food. Or custom cultures. Maybe I have different types of fermentation cultures or other types of products I can use that uh, I can synthesize uh, special yogurts or tailor-made just for you based on your gut biome. These are all aspects that I think we're seeing come out with food technology. But there is, a, there is kind of a dark side to all this processing and food technology and everything. Let me just kind of show you one. So here's two food labels, food ingredient labels. One is USDA inspected beef, salt, pepper. The other is you know, textured wheat protein, coconut oil, protein, potato protein, natural flavors, yeast extracts, soy protein, a lot longer list more of a, I call a chemical soup. Which one would you choose if you had to choose between these two foods? They're, they're similar tasting foods. I think you'd probably choose the one on the left. Well, let's see what it is. In fact, the left is a McDonald's hamburger and the right is an impossible burger or a Beyond Meat burger, which are the plant-based protein. Although they seem to be healthier, they, use, they don't use livestock meat, they're better for the environment, they are ultra processed and they do have a lot of interesting ingredients in order to mimic the flavor of beef. Where McDonald's is just you know, beef with salt and pepper, a very, very basic high quality product in that respect. So interesting dilemma for you as dietitians and, and, and nutritionists is that how do we deal with all of these new processing technologies, vertical farming, you know, uh, plant-based proteins, cell-based meats, how do we deal with this from a nutritional perspective when the innovation is happening faster than our ability to analyze it and to, to prove it out? Well, this is something policymakers are having to deal with as well. Whether you have my plate, you know, the US government, USDA uh, food guidelines, or the European Eat Lancet report, which actually said reducing the amount of animal-based proteins we should eat and increasing vegetable proteins not just for a health reason, but for environmental factors. Similarly, the Canadian Food Guide talked about environment and sustainability as part of their nutritional recommendations. So policy makers are kind of in this dilemma between nutritional advice, environmental advice, and then economic advice as well, the, the health and well-being of, of households' ability to pay for it and farmers getting money to make it as well. So creating much more complexity into our policy decisions. So how can you, as, nu as nutritional students, dietetic professionals, 
How can you capture this health and wellness opportunity that consumers are embracing? Well, let's first look at how the new food consumers shop. First of all, they're concerned about well being and health. They're looking at well being and health in a broader context of fitness and nutrition and stress and sleep and all these other aspects. Second, they're exploring by grazing and snacking. We no longer eat three meals a day. We, we sometimes snack seven days a week. We have smaller portions throughout the day. And particularly with all our Zoom calls, I'm sure each one of you has a small bowl of snacks that you have close by that you can eat in between your calls. And so snacking has become a part of our eating culture. And so people explore new tastes and new cuisines as well. We want healthy, but we also want indulgent. You know what, I still like having a big hamburger. I don't eat it very often, but when I do it, it's a really good hamburger or a really good pizza. I wanna eat healthier, but I still have those cravings. And it's not just about body nutritional health, it's also about mental health as well. And sometimes those foods help me mentally, particularly during the pandemic, as I mentioned with comfort food, helping us deal with stress. I trust my friends more than ads. I don't look at advertising and, and mo most of the consumers don't look at advertising the same way they did 10 or 15 years ago. And consumer product companies know this. That's why they're spending more time with influencers and social media people. And I trust my friends. Remember the nutritional advice I get from my mom and my family or my friends. And so my Facebook friends become my cohort of where I go to for suggestions. And how do we influence them? I mistrust the government and corporations. Uh, I think there's some trust in government that's come back because of the vaccine rollout. But generally, consumers don't trust big, big business and they don't trust big government. And so they look for, that's why we've seen a growth in small farmers in some of the small startups and some of the small boutique uh, types of food, local farming, local produce have all grown because of that community focus and, and trying to get away from this big is better. And they actively seek information with the aid of technology. Everybody looks not only the label on the product, but they're, they're searching it on Google. They're looking for, you know, does it have the allergens? Is it, you know, is it, is it in my keto diet? Is it, is it healthy? They're looking for the recommendations. They're looking for how other people on Amazon rated it. This is the information that consumers are going after these days to make their food choices. So how has the pandemic impacted this? Well, there's, what I'll call the post-COVID consumer. And there's gonna be some behaviors that will bounce back. Leisure travel. We're gonna see leisure travel go up tremendously as people wanna get back up once we quell the pandemic globally, which we're still far away from, particularly what's happening in India right now. Leisure travel rebound, business travel may not. And the reason business travel may not is companies have woken up to the fact that, hey, I can now work and my company works Without a travel budget, I don't need the same travel budget as before. And so conferences and trade shows are going to have to adjust as business travel is probably going to be curtailed for several years. Eating out is going to come back as well. We're seeing already as restaurants start to open in the U.S., people wanting to get out. Now they still want to eat outdoors. They don't want to mingle inside. They're still wearing masks. They're still cautious. But they want to get out. They've been eating at home for so long. They want to discover. There's a sense of a uber uberance out there as well. Some behaviors are sticking. We're going to continue to buy online our groceries and virtual healthcare. Telemedicine got a big kick up during the pandemic. And so we're going to see more of that occurring as consumers are comfortable talking to their doctor, talking to their medical practitioner over a Zoom call like this. Some things may never come back. Five days in the office. Uh, most companies are gearing up that people may only come back two or three days because working from home works. And so if we can adjust a flexible schedule where you can work from home partially and come to the office partially, that may be what the new normal is as companies are looking at how to better deal with their, the mental stress and the mental health of their customers. And we've learned several things through the pandemic. We've learned to reduce food waste because we've eaten at home, we've seen how much food we throw out and we've seen how much packaging we've thrown out, particularly if we've brought back meal kits. Wow, all that plastic, all those extra, ice packs and everything else, food waste and package waste are really gonna be something that we focus on. We're reading package labels more to understand what the ingredients are, and we're focusing on nutrition and we're focusing on immunity 
particularly to try to keep us healthier through all of this as well. So if we look at that, some key questions for retailers and brands that they're asking themselves. One, how well do you understand the health attributes of your ingredients? Do you understand what your ingredients are and how consumers perceive them as being healthy or nutritious? And companies are trying to really focus on clean label is one big area that they're working on and looking at trying to reduce ingredients and minimize and have healthier ingredients, no trans fats, et cetera. Second, are they prepared for ingredient information and process transparency? Consumers wanna know what the product is, what's in it, where did it come from, how it was made. And there's plenty of sources of that on the internet. And so companies need to be prepared to be able to be fully transparent on their product. And third, how well do we understand the consumer as a data feed? Remember, as we go on to Open Table, as we go on to Uber Eats or all these other, they're collecting information on us and they're finding out what things we look at and what things we don't. We've become a data feed for them. And there's all these new technologies and apps and things like that that are collecting information of consumers of how they shop for food, how, they, how their diets are put together, how they choose their meal plans. That's a new data feed that's being used that should be used by nutritionists as well to understand consumer behavior and food choices and how they go about it. So we look at some of these things, technology is really gonna have even more of an influence. So how will technology continue to influence the food industry? First, COVID has accelerated the move to online purchases, as I mentioned. Second, in addition to taste and price, consumers are looking for health and well-being outcomes. It used to be the three main things that, that food products uh, choice was taste, price, and convenience. Well, convenience is now a bit more murky because convenience now is going on your phone, going onto your computer and just ordering it and having it delivered. It's not the same as having to go out to a store. And what is replaced at a number three position is health and wellness. Consumers look at health and wellness is one of the top three things they look for, <clears throat> excuse me, when they buy food. Third, biofeedback and activity monitors are now mainstream and they're gonna become even more ubiquitous, more common because they're coming down in price. And finally, consumers expect a do-it-yourself approach to personal well-being. They expect to be able to gather information and make their own choices on food make their own choices on activity, make their own choices on healthcare for that matter. <clears throat> so doctors and the medical establishment are having to deal with this as well as, as nutritionists and dietetic professionals as well. How do we inform and help consumers make the right choice? Because they're no longer gonna be expected to be dictated to. And they know they have lots of places they can go in order to get information. So as you look at nutrition experts, how do you remain relevant <clears throat> as a nutrition expert, as a dietetic professional, when do-it-yourself health becomes normalized? Second, when feedback technology and artificial intelligence are everywhere, they're ubiquitous. Third, when influencer models dominate communication, whether it's a YouTube influencer or social media, <clears throat> when they dominate the communications, how do you manage that? <clears throat> and the big question is, who influences the influencer? Are you influencing the influencer? Are you providing that? If they have the contact and the communications and if consumers are going to them, how do you provide influence to them so they're giving them the right information as well? Now, one of the, the great things is as I work with startups, I'm seeing an interesting convergence of sciences. When I go to a startup right now, I see three main kind of expertise within the startup room. So if I go to a vertical farming operation, an indoor growing operation, like the picture behind me, what I find is I'll have a room with a few data scientists who are doing artificial intelligence, who are doing machine learning, who are taking all this information. I find a food or plant scientist who is looking at the how I grow the plant better, how I grow it with more, more uh, flavor, more nutrition, grow it faster, better yields. And I have a culinary person that says, okay, how do I make it taste great? How do I put it on the plate? How do I make it appealing to the consumer? In many cases, what I've not seen is the nutritional expert. But what I am hearing now from many of my startups that are particularly in the health, healthy foods, nutritious foods, good foods, organic foods, 
is they're asking for nutritional expertise. They're asking for that nutritional expert to come in and help them with their data scientists, with their food scientists, with their culinary expert to understand the nutritional density, the nutritional science, how to bring better products, better ingredients to bear for their customers to improve their health and wellness and to look for uh, better outcomes as well. So all in all, I'm super excited about the future of food and nutrition. I'm seeing the exuberance of the startups and the, and the, the amount of money that's going into different types of technologies. I'm seeing people like yourselves, nutrition and dietetics professionals. I think you're at the cusp of a major breakthrough. You hold really that kind of integral part to bring together the various parties to really talk about health and nutrition from a, how do we make the food? Where did it come from? What is the food? Does it taste great? Does it look good on the plate? How do we bring all those things together? So it best serves the consumers as they're looking for health and wellness as part of their overall lifestyle and their future as well. I wanna thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, I, I now open up, I guess, for questions if there are any, uh, but thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to having a chance to talk to you. David, so impressive, so informative. Uh, we are just so fortunate to have you here with us this evening to share this insight. And, and I, I speak on behalf of everyone here, absolutely outstanding. And we appreciate the opportunity to have some questions provided. And so a few have been sent to me separately. Um, one question is as credential practitioners, as future RDNs, how do we outpace the influencers who are not practicing with, with an evidence basis? Well, I mean, first, if you, I would say, what gives those influencers the credential? They just happen to be loud and proud, I guess. They're just out there. Uh, there's no reason why you can't be influencers as well. And what is it that makes them influencers? Is it because they're a celebrity or is it because they just happen to have a good way of speaking and communicating? If you're not comfortable being an influencer yourself and getting out there, then maybe it's how do you align with those influencers to how to again, nudge them to talk better about what is nutrition. And for them, when they have questions coming from some of their social media contacts, that they reroute them to you so that you become that expert, that stable expert that can give some of that uh, information as well. Now, as you mentioned, some of the influencers are not science-based and they may be giving information which may not be um, the wisest information. Again, how do you, how do you fight that as well? Problem with food is it's an emotional experience. And one thing I've learned in life is you can never fight emotion with logic. So we have to figure out how to make nutrition and dietetic science an emotional bond as well with consumers. Excellent, very helpful. Another question that came in, countries like China are legally able to track their citizens' social media accounts without warrants. Do you see them leveraging this for healthy behaviors as well? And what could be the consequences of this? I see them leveraging it for healthy behaviors. I don't know, uh, but yeah, the consequences could be either light or dark, depending on which type of uh, science fiction you like to watch on either dystopian or more uh, a, a bright future. The um, yeah, the problem with with uh, doing that could be that if you're not eating right, and if you're uh, eating uh, high caloric, low nutritional density foods, you may get taxed more, or you may get someone from the health department coming and visit you, or etc. So. Um, I'm scared of that. Uh, I think it should all be an opt-in approach. I mean, what Apple is doing now with their new iPhones is that it's an opt-in for Facebook. So Facebook could no longer track you on an iPhone if you choose to opt out. Excellent. Uh, another question, as, as a country and a society, we were making great strides over the last few decades in reducing packaging and reducing waste in terms of product waste. Obviously, COVID-19 has pulled us back into some of that. Where do you see that headed next? Will, there, will it rebalance and recalibrate itself? Yes, it definitely will rebound and rebalance. We're already seeing from consumers. They've seen how much waste. I mean, one of the things is it's opened consumers' eyes to how much waste is being created because it created it at home. Before, it was, it was invisible. I mean, if you went to a cafeteria or restaurant, you didn't know what they were throwing out at the back. Now you know what you're throwing out, and particularly packaging waste. And so there's a lot of pushback. And, and you know, <clears throat> some of the meal kit companies like HelloFresh and Blue Apron 
are really having to think hard about redesigning their packaging because consumers are just upset by the amount of packaging waste that's being created. So I see it coming back. <clears throat> In fact, sustainability, environmental concerns are becoming higher priority with consumers now, and obviously very high priority with corporations who are dealing with it as far as their investors are asking for them to present that. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, another question that came in, what variables or factors can help explain the increase in nutrition, exercise, and wellness focus while obesity continues to increase? <clears throat> the golden question. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a golden question. And, um, you know, having spent time working with hunger relief organizations like Feeding America and Food Depository, and, you know, uh, as, as many of you know, uh, obesity is not a case of eating too much food. It's just eating too much wrong food. And obesity is just another form of malnutrition in some way, your high caloric, low nutritional, nutritional density. So I think, you know, that's healthy, obesity, food access are all part of it. And that's why it's not just around nutrition, it's all around, it's, it's again, as I mentioned, environmental, but it's also around social justice and social. You know, we have, we make more food in the world than we need, but we're just not getting it to the right people at the right time. And so not everybody has access to healthy food. Not everybody knows to eat healthy foods. I mean, if you've been brought up on a certain diet that's, that's high in fat and high in carbohydrates and, and never knew to eat more fruits and vegetables, then your taste buds, and, and it takes training to change that. So I think, you know, we're dealing with, to change those behaviors requires understanding the frame of reference that these people are coming from that, that are not eating well. And it may be, due to dietary preferences, it may be due to cultural background, it may be due to economic situations, and we need to understand all of those. Well, thank you. David, once again, I'm going to thank you personally. The only thing missing this evening is having you here in person, and we're going to get you here and let you engage with, with all of our students and researchers. And for those of you that don't know, I, I know Dave a, a little more than, than some of us, and the wealth of knowledge and the breadth of his, his briefcase is, is quite extensive. And I think there are so many things that you could come and share with us. Just like Dr. Kidd suggested when we started off, perhaps we can all go to our digital reactions and just, just show us some applause. And also please join me in going to the chat and putting a, a few points in there about what this session meant to you and how thankful we are. Well, thank you, I, I appreciate it. And I'd love to be there live uh, and uh, meet up with all of you as well. Here come some of the comments. So I there hope you go. appreciate them, David. Yeah, well, thank you, yes. And I, I don't know whether to go home this evening and have supper or take a picture of it first now. So that, that'll be a, to a toss up. Or, or, or walk, walk 9,500 steps and just keep on going past your front door. Yeah. <laughs> I do know this, I'd like to pick some of that lettuce behind you and make a salad, that, that looks wonderful. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a company in San Francisco called Plenty that's growing hydroponic greens within a, a vertical uh, environmentally controlled uh, greenhouse. Wonderful. Look at all these wonderful comments. Thank you everyone for leaving those with us. I'll be sure to uh, take a transcription of those and share them with, with David directly. Um, so people are slowly exiting, leaving their, con their comments. We really appreciate it. Someone was speaking. Oh, sorry, Dr. Sarah, I think there was one question in the chat that wasn't addressed about um, how has the introduction of wearable fitness trackers increased eating disorder prevalence or has it? I don't know. That's a good question. That's, that's something we got to dig into. <laughs> you know, Thank you, Rick. I didn't see that. Thank you for, for bringing that. So. That's, a, that's a very good question. Look at the impact. Best presentation I've had, so excellent. That was my mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, no, appreciate it. Yeah, this is wonderful.